Detroit Homecoming has been made possible in part by Urban Science, guiding business through science. Make decisions by what you know, not what you think. And by the William Davidson Foundation, advancing the cultural, economic, and civic vitality of Southeast Michigan, the state of Israel, and the Jewish community. Um, so I said a uh, uh, very tight program. Um, you'll be able to do the meetups tomorrow at breakfast at the Lexus Vel Velodrome. Our speakers are joining us. Um, it is my pleasure now to get the kick off the program by introducing the two principals behind the platform, our hosts, Dietrich Noor and Peter Cummings uh, from the platform. Welcome. I'm Peter Cummings, and the gentleman who has slightly less hair than I have is Dietrich Knorr, and he's my partner, and I'm uh, pleased and proud to say so. I want to welcome everybody to the Fisher Building. It's, uh, uh, in a way, the Fisher Building represented a, a, a second or a third homecoming for me. I, um, I became a Detroiter, in essence, uh, and for those of you who don't have any De real Detroit connections, this is a strategy I would suggest. I married a Detroiter. <laughs> and, 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 and this is she, Julie Fisher Cummings. Um, and, um, uh, and, and we came to Detroit in 1989 to put our children in Cranbrook. I, I started a company, a real estate company in Florida that my older son now, now runs. And we came here to put our kids into Cranbrook, and I somehow, somewhat as a result of uh, her father's passion, her late father's passion for the city, got involved in the city and, um, and met Sue Mosey and did a lot of work uh, in partnership with Sue in Midtown 20 years ago. Um, uh, 21, 22 years ago, we started working together. Uh, in, in the welcome, that I want to give, and I repeat this story frequently because to me it's, it's a very powerful message about coming back and about investing in the city. And it's the, it's the whole food story. And Sue and I really were partners in that venture. Uh, Walter Robb, then co-CEO of uh, Whole Foods, came into town, met with Sue. Sue connected uh, uh, Walter Robb and his team with me and our team. and. Um, we finally got a lease done and figured out how to finance it and got the store uh, built. But the, the part of the story that to me is powerful is I remember talking to Walter Robb and he said, we're committed to doing this, we think it's important, we think the store will perform at the lower end of um, our portfolio of stores. So it's a 21,000 foot store. And uh, they thought the store would do maybe 12 to $15 million of business, five, $600 a foot. Today, that store does just over $600,000 a week of business. So a store that they projected to do 12 to 15 million is doing 30 million. And I share that with you because I wanna share what that enabled me to see. Uh, prior to that experience, I saw Detroit as a series of challenges. I saw it as blighted, as distressed. Um, but because of that experience, I started thinking of Detroit instead as grossly underserved. Uh, and it remains to this day grossly underserved, particularly the residents in the neighborhoods are grossly underserved. So I get calls from time to time uh, asking me, uh, are there still opportunities in Detroit? Should we still be looking in Detroit? And my answer is always the same. We have more opportunities in Detroit than we have talent in the field that's able to take advantage of them. So that's my message of welcome. I'm delighted to see you here. Dietrich, do you have anything you want to add? Well, real quick. Um 
just wanted to use this opportunity to thank um, Mary Kramer, her team, and Cranes to uh, put this on and to host it up here at the Fisher Building. We actually tried to have you all up here last year. Uh, couldn't pull it off uh, in the required time frame, and, and a year later we are much better prepared to to welcome you here, to showcase um, you know this amazing building, and to also give you a sense for you know the greater New Center area with its surrounding neighborhoods, Milwaukee Junction, uh, Tech Town, New Center, North End, and so on. And um, and I uh, created a tour um, for you that uh, Mary. Um, it's very concerned that it will be more than an hour, but it won't be more than an hour. Uh, it should, it should uh, allow you to see, uh, hopefully, uh, parts of the city that maybe you haven't driven through before. And, uh, and, and again, uh, you know, really excited to have you here. Um, I think this is going to be a great program. And um, uh, welcome to the Fisher Building. And as a Detroit resident and a shopper, I can just say the retail mix in this building has come a long way since when I first came to Detroit. And there were like two stores and a coffee shop. And now I can shop for women's clothes in Yama. And there's so much more here now. And it's going to be a wonderful anchor for, this, for the new center area. Um, our first segment, we're going to focus on a key tool that the city of Detroit is using to stimulate development in neighborhoods. It's called the Strategic Neighborhood Fund. And we're going to hear from three key players who are going to run through some of the basics. And they're going to be followed by a panel led by Kevin Johnson. Kevin is an Atlanta transplant to Detroit, just became president and CEO of the Detroit Economic Growth Corp. So people's bios are in your pa packets. I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, just telling you uh, the, the full bio. But I'd like to welcome to the stage the three uh, first speakers. First, we have Sue Mosey from Midtown Detroit, Inc. Um, she's a former Newsmaker of the Year, named by Cranes, for her patient stewardship of Midtown development. Um, it's been one of the longest planning and development um, case studies ever, but boy, are the results great. Um, she's also often referred to as the mayor of Midtown. Next, we have Arthur Jemison, who leads city services and infrastructure for the city of Detroit, part of Mike, Mayor Mike Duggan's team. And finally, Mike Smith, the VP of Neighborhoods at Invest Detroit, credited, uh, created to help facilitate funding from public, private, and foundation sectors in the city of Detroit. Now, each of these people is going to speak individually. They have slides. Here's the clicker right here, I believe. Is this the clicker? Does anybody know? It is? Okay. All right. Oh, the green button. Okay. Uh, and then oh, we're going to move in to the panel um, and uh, have some Q&A after that. So welcome, Sue. You're first up. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the real estate uh, session for the homecoming. Uh, everybody hear me in the back? Okay. I got five minutes, so I got to take 30 years and do it in five. So um, one of the things I was asked to talk about a little bit was just like market trends, right? What's happening in uh, the generally in the downtown and midtown area? Um, so I'll just go back to things started getting a lot better post-bankruptcy, post-recession. That's when we started seeing sort of the uptick. Downtown's really focused on big adaptive reuse, uh, lots of placemaking and activation and public space development. Midtown's concentrated on smaller mixed use sort of major rezonings, micro planning for smaller districts, boutique retail, food and beverage, all of those things. Uh, a number of years ago, when the rail and the streetcar was first envisioned, we all got together, a huge group of us did a big transit-oriented development plan. We really wanted to get ahead of that investment and really start thinking about how to best drive development patterns here. So one of the best things that came out of that was a bunch of capital. Uh, in a number of different funds that was put together with a bunch of partners, Kresge, um, Invest Detroit, Capital Impact Partners and others, and we put together about 50 million in a variety of capital that to use for sub debt, senior debt, uh, recoverable grants, everything you could imagine to try to get these deals done. So we identified a number of deals, about 20 of them, and you'll see on the one on the right here, where, where is that, it's coming up here and it's not coming up here. 
Okay, there it is. So you'll see these are an example of three. Third Grand, the Strathmore, which we co-developed that as a mixed income, mixed use project, and also the Broderick. So a lot of these bigger scale projects had been stuck. They really weren't making market sense. So these sources of capital really got those over the finish line, plus many others. So today, you know, almost all these projects have been done. They've had a lot of catalytic impacts that comps really helped move uh, the lenders to a comfortable position for continuing to lend. Um, and so that's really, I think, the contribution. Now, one of the things we've been doing is looking at how our approach can potentially be utilized in some of the thinking about these Detroit strategic neighborhoods. So the things that we found are the most important, collaboration, and that's between foundations, city, states, CDFIs, lenders, and nonprofits, property control, either directly or indirectly through trusted partners, shared capital, uh, necessary incentives, so that they're all really set up and established, uh, curated retail, service, and food and beverage kind of uh, strategy for these districts, mixed, mixed income housing as the model, and then also a public space strategy. So it's really just the basics. And then a couple of years ago, we decided to move more towards buying up some strategic portfolios of property. This, this shot is one of the blocks we purchased. Um, it's actually a whole bunch of uh, historic, older industrial properties. We then bought a 120,000 square foot school. We're building some net zero energy single family homes all around this corridor. And the reason we did that was to take these older industrial buildings that have a lot of character, go to an area that's right on the edge of the development that's currently occurring. Uh, we then added a bunch of different uses together. So in this corridor project, we have job training, we have small scale manufacturing coming in, we have accelerator space, we have net zero homes, we have large community innovation center that we're opening. So a whole bunch of things to really make this work. And then to round it off also with public space that we're gonna be creating in the center of this. So all of this is now funded moving forward. Most of it's under construction now. And that gives you an idea of like the second kind of level of the development strategy we've been doing here. And then just the current state of the market because of the efforts that we've been doing with all of these partners, the platform and many others, this is kind of where we are today, in the Woodward corridor, meaning Midtown, Techtown, New Center together, uh, which are the three districts we represent. We have a population increase, finally, after 30 years. Uh, we have good rental occupancy, we have climbing rental rates, we have lots of stuff in the pipeline. Newest thing is hotels. We actually have um, 875 keys in the pipeline. Uh, that goes from like 40 rooms. Um, and then we have, you know, getting condo pricing at 360 a square foot, the average, finally getting a condo market that's beginning to make sense here, given the cost. Bad news is that construction costs are going up a lot. Um, these are currently what most projects are seeing. Um, but that's just another challenge I think we're all dealing with right now. But generally things are moving in a good direction. So I think my role in this was really just to have Arthur come up here and tell you how he's going to get all this done, like pronto, in like 10 neighborhoods. And Arthur, why don't you come up and tell us about this? <laughs> So we work on very uh, tight timelines here, so I'll try, to be, uh, I'll try to be brief. So I do need to say thank you, though, to Sue, whose work really, um, frankly, set the framework for the way that we do our work in, in bringing in, uh, A, the collaboration with uh, the private partners, uh, but more importantly, sort of identifying a vision and then executing it against it. Um, so let's talk about uh, SNF and, and the way that the city is uh, organizing itself to support the implementation of the Strategic Neighborhood Fund 2.0. Um, so one of the things that our mayor is very focused on is um, identifying and designing um, solid pilots, executing and evaluating those pilot projects, and then bringing them to scale. We wouldn't be able to talk about any of those things without the work that Sue has done in Midtown, putting together uh, private sources, grant sources, et cetera, uh, to make the uh, investments that drove the $7 billion of investment shown on the prior slide. Um, we also wouldn't be able to do it if we did not have the partnership we continue to enjoy with Invest Detroit um, and the three um, areas where they piloted Strategic Neighborhood, one, one, uh, strategic neighborhood Fund 1.0. Um, those neighborhoods have experienced uh, really significant change. You can walk down Agnes Street 
in, uh, in, um, in West Village and see some of that change. Um, but they really sh sort of set the framework again and showed us how it's done. So now taking successful pilots and expanding them and making them into um, each of them into sort of 10 neighborhoods, not just three, uh, with these kind of investments. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the way that the city's organizing itself to do it. Uh, what you see here on the slide behind me are four uh, pictures um, that show the land uses that we're using and the way uh, that we're using them. They bring together three streams of work. The work associated with Strategic Neighborhood Fund 1.0, the work associated with the affordable housing, uh, uh, affordable housing agenda the city has, and importantly, the way that we've been engaging neighbors uh, in uh, community, through a community engagement process led by our planning department. Um, what you see in this next slide are the uh, expansion from uh, three to 10 neighborhoods. We're gonna bring um, an individual focus on the four land uses we, you saw on the prior slide, streetscapes, single family, multifamily, um, parks, um, and uh, all together uh, in a way that uh, allows us to create and catalyze uh, the, the kind of two things, the, the strength and uh, strong local commercial markets um, and a preservation uh, of affordable housing in those neighborhoods and an integration of a new mixed income affordable housing into uh, the markets that are being created in each of these 10 places. Um, you can see that uh, in, our, in our goals here, you know, the, the 10 neighborhoods, uh, the 10,000 units of preservation, the 2,000 units of affordable housing, and you can see it in um, the way that we think about the work that we're doing. Uh, this slide uh, talks about uh, the way that uh, private debt, public debt, the, um, the investment of tax credits and other uh, affordable housing resources all combine uh, to create uh, a, a really significant investment over time. So what I'd like to do next is introduce um, our partner uh, who helps us execute all this work um, and, and leads it, uh, Invest Detroit, as represented uh, by Mike Smith. Mike, do you mind coming up and saying a few words? Great to see you, Mike. Arthur had a minute and a half left, which is the first time he's been that fast at a presentation. I'm going to do this Socratic method style. I'm going to ask myself a question and then try to answer it for you guys. We'll see if this works. So what does the neighborhood investment look like at a neighborhood scale? We are taking a step back and focusing on eight to 15 blocks at a time and really trying to target these nodes of activity and get them going through supporting three to five real estate projects, supporting an adjacent park, supporting public good infrastructure, infrastructure such as streetscapes and lights, uh, supporting single family housing. And this slide right here, number one in the lower right hand corner of the map is Cliff Brown's project. You'll be hearing from Cliff next and I'm actually gonna t embarrass him a little bit on the next slide. Uh, a bigger project that is uh, about a $20 million project is at number two. The adjacent park is in the upper left hand corner at number 10. The streetscape is going in along the purple line at number nine. And finally, the single family housing intervention that's gonna be stabilizing somewhere between 30 and 50 homes is literally happening just to the northwest of that building in, in the northwest corner there. So this is a focused approach to get things going. Question two, how does this look like at a project scale? Cliff led a $4.1 million new construction development at West Village. It's probably the first new construction there and how we figure over 30 years, maybe the first modern design new construction in Detroit ever. This project, which is relatively small by project scales, six layers of financing just to make this happen. These are incredibly difficult deals. It takes a lot of effort on local partners who have experience on the ground. Example here with Cliff. Cliff inherited uh, some land that we had fallen into. He inherited an architect, which is a very different way of doing things. Cliff immediately took the bull by the horns, uh, partnered with Broder Saxe, who normally does projects at a much bigger scale. And at the very first meeting, Cliff walks in, I walk in, the architect walks in. Door opens, Broder Saxe rolls in seven people deep with all the support. So what is happening here is an incredible collaboration between many partners, all of whom recognize the huge lift it's gonna to take to make all this happen. Third, how are we all supporting this? This is an incredible mix of public, private, and philanthropic money. Right here on the screen is a measure of just the philanthropic and the public support. The city itself is in for 59 million, state's in for uh, 15 million, and philanthropy is gonna be supporting this with 56 million. So there's a lot of subsidy tools coming to the table to mitigate risk, start these first investments, and get these markets going. How do you guys connect, if this button works? There we go. How do you guys connect? 
There are quite a few ways. One is over the next few years, you're going to be seeing a series of RFPs coming out in all these neighborhoods across Detroit. This is just one illustrative example of this coming forward. Specifically, how do you connect? In your packet in front of you are wonderful tools. One is that's listed uh, full of developers for are their bios, other ways to look at this. There are, there's a breakfast tomorrow, which I'm going to put a pin in for one second. And finally, there's that website, developdetroit.org, or detroitdevelopment.org. I probably should get that right. Go there. You'll see a list of these projects I talked about on the previous screen. This, these are some of the many ways to connect. All our contact info is there. Reach out to us as well. Finally, what is the takeaway of all this? The takeaway is the time is now. This is going to be a billion dollar initiative across growth and inclusion tools across the neighborhoods outside the greater downtown. I got the opportunity to uh, participate for the first time in homecoming last year, and I couldn't believe how many expats came up incredibly passionate about getting involved in the recovery of their city that they still know and love and call home. This is the way to do it. Tomorrow at 8 a.m., the one takeaway of this whole thing, tomorrow at 8 a.m. is going to be a breakfast. All these developers who are incredibly talented and have boots on the ground capacity and know-how are going to be there. And if you guys go there and meet with them and find relationships, the work that they are doing can become even more impactful. You guys can have a direct impact as well. So 8 a.m. tomorrow, billion dollar initiative, neighborhoods. Thank you. So I wanted to let Mike get on because, uh, and, and, but I did want to reclaim my time as, as a, some, is a phrase that sometimes people use. I, I wanted to make sure that you know that the investment that we're talking about here, um, it, not only do you have examples like Sue to look to, um, the city has organized itself in a way to, to implement SNF where you can count on there being a, a meeting uh, every single week with all department heads about the implementation execution of the public components of all of these projects. So if you're making an investment in uh, Old Redford and you're making an investment in a residential project, a, a school rehabilitation into housing in that neighborhood, you can be assured that every week I and my team members and I'll remember the director of DPW and the director of the housing department, who's also uh, here tonight, uh, this afternoon, and the director of all the affiliated departments are going to be meeting every week to identify progress that's been made and progress that needs to be made uh, to execute each of these projects. So we've taken the extra step in hopes that um, looking at the example that Sue and others have given us to say, how do we get the government organized in a way to enable these investments uh, so you can have the comfort uh, that the, the, the city, uh, not just verbally and in presentations like this, but, uh, but in the city engineer's office and in the Department of Housing and Revitalization's credit committee, that your projects are of the highest priority. So I wanted to make sure you heard that before we left. Great presentations. I saw people taking notes, and I just want to say that a lot of this is going to be in your folders, but we also are sending out to every registered person here today the, a PDF of all the slides, all the presenters, all in sequence, one little bundle that you'll be able to have so you don't have to take so many notes. Um, next, we are going to hear from a panel of, uh, let's see, there are three people on this next panel. It's going to be moderated by Kevin Johnson, President and CEO of the Detroit Economic Growth Corp. We have Aaron Siebert, Social Investment Officer from the Kresge Foundation. If folks could start coming up as I call your name. Uh, Gary Torgo, Chairman, Chemical Bank, and founder of the Sterling Group. Um, been making some news here lately in downtown Detroit. Cliff Brown, you heard uh, his project um, mentioned earlier. Um, uh, managing partner of Woodbourne Partners, and he his project in West Village was mentioned earlier. And I believe I'm turning it over to you, Mr. Johnson. Yeah. Well, good afternoon. Um, thank you for uh, allowing us to spend some time with you this afternoon. I, I think it's important that we uh, set the stage relative to the alignment of what we do as the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation, how the Strategic Neighborhood Fund influences the work that we're trying to accomplish and really trying to make sure 
that there is uh, this thing that I've been reading about since I moved here from Atlanta about one Detroit. Uh, first, full disclosure, I only thought there was, there was one Detroit. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out where the other one is. Uh, and so when I got here, I began to understand where the other Detroit is, and it is fairly pronounced. And so this effort by the Strategic Neighborhood Fund is really to try to close the, the idea and manifest the thought around what one Detroit really means. Uh, and so I think what we'll try to get into today is about uh, how these investments uh, that the foundations are making, that private sector investments that are making, and entrepreneurial uh, investments are making really makes that one Detroit real. Uh, and so uh, with that, uh, I do want to say uh, that uh, driving investment uh, is key to what Detroit Economic Growth Corporation does. Um, so we're talking a lot about neighborhoods. One of the things you have to have when you establish neighborhoods is you have to have people who will have the position to earn the right to be in these wonderful neighborhoods. Good neighborhoods, good jobs. Bad neighborhoods, no jobs, okay? That's the foundational element of all of this investment that we're trying to attract into this, into this city. And so uh, our job uh, is to work on the attraction side of the equation. The attraction side. Attracting what? Private sector investment. Public-private partnerships. These are key. And so our role in that is to be a bridge builder, to be a connector. Uh, in that regard, and I think with that type of attitude and energy, we can see the neighborhood uh, fund reach its full potential uh, when you have someone there willing to be a part of the neighborhoods that we're trying to create. Uh, and so with that, uh, I've been asked to ask a series of questions of our panelists. Uh, and so I'm gonna start uh, with uh, my new and good friend, uh, Gary Turgo uh, with Chemical Bank. Now, you might have heard that Gary and his team are making a significant investment uh, in downtown Detroit. Uh, the question that we have is, why did you decide uh, to move uh, Chemical Bank's headquarters to Detroit? Our hometown bank, by the way. So those of you who are coming back home, if you need a bank, we got a hometown bank represented right here, so I just want to make sure that's clear. Plug on for uh, Chemical Bank. So, Gary? Thank you very much. Can I do it from here? You can do it. I think you can. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you, Kevin, my new good friend. <laughs> and uh, thanks, Cranes and Mary and all of you for organizing this. So uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I was involved in the starting of a small bank that grew pretty quickly into what was called Talmer Bank. Talmer Bank was headquartered in southeastern Michigan. We weren't big enough to be Detroit's hometown bank, but we were making a push. And about uh, two years ago, we made a decision to have a merger of equals with a wonderful 100-year institution headquartered in a small town called Midland, Michigan. Midland's got a great history. Chemical Bank was in Midland for 100 years. But we wanted to create a powerhouse bank that would really generate tremendous opportunity in southeastern Michigan. The 50% uh, of our state's economy is coming out of southeastern Michigan, and there is a lot of opportunity here. A number of years ago, a couple of our major banks moved their headquarters or merged out of Detroit, and there hasn't been a real powerhouse hometown bank for a lot of years. NBD, which was a fantastic bank in town, merged with First Chicago, they ended up part of the Chase world, but there wasn't really an opportunity for somebody to move into town and to become the new hometown bank. And we saw that opportunity. We kept a very large workforce in Midland. Our entire population of workers, employees, and colleagues are still in Midland. But we made a decision to come where the action was and to really supplant those banks that used to be the hometown bank and to become that hometown bank, and that's Chemical Bank. Today, we're a $20 billion institution. We're building a $100 million facility on Woodward, just down the street from the new 
Little Caesars headquarters. We're going to be right at the 50-yard line of what we see as Detroit with an opportunity to do great things for the city. We've got a large workforce. We're moving over 500 people to downtown Detroit to become that presence, and we're hopeful to be able to make a real statement about what's happened to Detroit. Today, there is an opportunity for a hometown bank. We are the largest headquartered bank in Michigan, and now we're going to be headquartered in Detroit, Mich Detroit Michigan. Second question. Yeah, I do, and I think I think uh, we can all sit down because I think these Can mics. Do you hear these mics working? Okay, okay good. that way we can have a little fireside chat, Great. Uh, if you will. Um, so, so the 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 question I want to ask Aaron, and I didn't really understand uh, this as it was presented to me, but but but, but Kresge and the Strategic Neighborhood Fund are interlinked. Um, what, what, what's so important about that for Kresge? Yeah, so um, Mike's working. Okay. Mike's work. Um, so, you know, for Kresge, we are hyper focused on improving the quality of life for Detroit residents, particularly in neighborhoods, right? And if you look at the work that we had done historically through the Midtown and the Downtown Corridor, we served as a traditional grant maker function, supporting organizations through general operating support, project finance, these kind of things. As we've evolved as an organization, we've brought additional tools on. So you know, before I get out this panel, I'm clear, I do not do any grant making. So I am no use to anybody who wants a grant. I do debt, I do equity, I do loan guarantees. I got hired away from a bank to basically look at the spectrum of activities that we were doing and say, what is the highest and best use for our capital? And when we think about a, uh, an effort like the strategic neighborhood, what that ought to be to all of the people in this room is a signal to the market of where philanthropy is going to come in and de-risk those neighborhoods in a way that I think we largely did in downtown and midtown, right? That strategic neighborhood fund is gonna be used to get control of assets, to improve uh, public space, and to effectively provide non-returnable equity into projects that are of strategic importance in neighborhoods. And so for an organization like Kresge, I didn't appreciate this until I came here um, into the foundation. We have tremendous view over what the ecosystem needs, right? So we want a healthy and vibrant community development system, and we want that system to equitably benefit low-income people in Detroit. And so when we look across the spectrum and we see a need for permanent equity in projects, we need philanthropy in, in stewardship organizations that support neighborhoods. We need debt capital into CDFIs to provide sub-debt mezzanine and acquisition financing. We need equity into the balance sheets of, of uh, certain development organizations to bring projects forward. We need to de-risk certain transactions and bridge financing sources. All of these things take subsidy, and it still is the case in the Detroit market that subsidy is, is, you know, is needed to move a lot of projects. So we are trying to be very surgical, and, and I think you'll find in the Detroit community, if you're not familiar with it, the philanthropic sector is highly aligned. We talk daily, weekly, about what is in the pipeline. You know, I, I've got all of these loan committee reports and all these pipeline reports that we get, and I can see across the spectrum where is the capital needed most to accelerate development in a way that we think will benefit the most people, mm -hmm. particularly low-income people, in Detroit's neighborhoods. So, you know, philanthropy in this city, um, I, I think, uh, has served an important role and will continue to serve an important role, but we're using very different tools. SNF is a good example of that, and I think over the next few months and, and you know, a couple of years, you'll see us take other very unique positions, risk positions, uh, non-grant-making roles uh, in this ecosystem that yeah. complement that effort. Well, you know, s subsidy is a good word if it's used the right way. <laughs> uh, and so one of the good ways it has been used uh, is with uh, Cliff in, in, your, in your project. You're the first recipient of that. Talk a little bit about, you know, why that benefited your business in getting it up uh, and, and running. Uh, so it, it's important to understand, I think most people in the crowd understand that one of the challenges as a small developer is access to capital. Um, it does, it, it creates a number of problems, but one is it slows projects down. And so if you think about the co, and, and Mike talked about a lot of the amazing things we're able to do with the co, probably um, the most important offshoot of this and why it's a good understanding of why the Strategic Neighborhood Fund is, is so important is, is we sat down with Invest Detroit in the middle of June of 2016 to discuss how we could make the co happen. By November of 2017, and I should say November 1st, of 2017, we had planned, funded, uh, designed, built, and opened up 
100% leased um, at the cult, which is somewhat unheard of uh, in the city of Detroit. And um, the access to capital just removed one further barrier there. We really knew what our capital stack was going to look like, and we could just go and execute. And so um, it just created an, op uh, an amazing opportunity just to focus on execution and to move everything else out of the way. Mm -hmm. And then also for, for me as a developer, we had done the Scott at Brush Park, but in everybody's world, they looked at that as a Broder and Saxe project. They ignored the fact that we had worked on that project for seven years and, and we were in it four years before Todd Rich really came along and supported us in that project. And so it allowed people to see that Woodbourne as an entity could operate and could execute and largely led to mm -hmm. our ability to partner on the uh, Frederick Douglass neighborhood with Bedrock. And, and I think it's important to note that in, in neighborhoods, um, as wonderful as our large scale developers are, um, there's a connectivity between smaller developers and neighborhoods uh, because you, you typically those folks uh, had some blood in the soil. They, they understand the flow. And, and so when we can attract smaller developers into the system, it allows for the spread of, of neighborhood redevelopment to occur at a much faster pace. Uh, and so Gary, the question uh, that I had for you uh, related to the Strategic Neighborhood Fund is about what do you see as the value in a Strategic Neighborhood Fund uh, and, and how is the fundraising effort going? Because that's, that's, cri that's critical uh, in this whole conversation as well. So the... Um the Strategic Neighborhood Fund is as critical as any development that's going on in Detroit. Without the neighborhoods, nothing, everything pales. We need to, to do as much as we possibly can as a community. So when the mayor announced this billion dollar initiative and the philanthropic community was ready to jump in, it was important that they felt that they had corporate partners, that corporate Detroit was willing to adjust its thinking to say we need to be a part of this. And so we set a goal as, a, as corporate Detroit of $50 million so that there could be a champion in every one of these neighborhoods and that we could ask corporations to analyze this as part of their strategic plan and to contribute a significant amount of money to one of these neighborhoods and so that we could have champions in each one of these. The fundraising is going great. Uh, the mayor does a great job. There's a lot of corporate interest and we are gonna hit our goal of 50 million and maybe exceed it. Uh, I, I think um, with, with that kind of commitment at a corporate level, um, it really kind of accelerates the things that you've seen on the screen that can happen. Uh, and so I, I know, Gary, you're in the, in the, in the guy in the team will, will meet and probably exceed that goal. But, but for, for Aaron, what set the strategic neighborhood apart from all the other things that, that Kresge is involved in? Why this and versus some other things that you guys are? I mean, I'm just going to piggyback on what Gary said. You know, it, it um, we will have failed as a foundation if we cannot bring prosperity to Detroit neighborhoods. And, you know, we're not solely responsible for that, right? What, what the work really is, is empowering Detroit residents to determine their own future, to bring about those sort of outcomes that we want neighborhood by neighborhood. But you need money to do that. Um, and so the Street Neighborhood Fund is set up as a vehicle that allows us to blend capital from corporate foundations, from private foundations, and then the other complementary tools that we're already funding, right? I mean, a lot mm -hmm. of the work that we're doing through many of the CDFIs, for instance, or the, or the general operating support that we do in neighborhoods for CDCs and otherwise, what they need is that, like I said, non-returnable equity to go into the neighborhoods to set the stage, to do the quality of life making, to catalyze a bunch of other things that are already being driven by the grant making that we're doing or the other capital tools. And I think, you know, we are always looking for opportunities where we can be highly aligned with the private sector. And I think, you know, we have shown that time and time again, particularly with Chemical and with other partners, where we have not only Strategic Neighborhood Fund, but other very complementary efforts like our Detroit um, uh, D, uh, DHM, Detroit uh, Home Mortgage Product, our support for um, uh, moving ready homes and minority developers in the single family space. These all stack up for us, so it made perfect sense mm -hmm. to fund an initiative like mm -hmm. this. So, so Cliff, you, you are, uh, you talked about 100% lease like, like that. Um, that's a developer's dream, I'm sure, uh, <laughs> to lease up like that. But, but how would you use this kind of the next step in this, whole, in this whole process, and how do you use it to overcome what you think to be kind of the next step in, this, in the 
in your development plans moving forward? So uh, one of the things that we've been fortunate, be, you know, with the DGC support and investor truck, um, Detroit support and the Strategic Neighborhood Fund is, is that we have patient capital in our deal. Mm -hmm. But we also understand as developers, our goal is ultimately to be able to grow and to be able to attract other capital. And so it's really been our desire to really focus on being able to return that capital as soon as possible and execute. And so uh, really from this project, we've been able to launch Woodmore Capital and Investments, and we're getting ready to launch a fund. We've been able to launch uh, Woodmore Property Management, which is a property management arm. So we've legitimately been able to create jobs above and beyond just connected to the co. Uh, and, and the job creation piece, as I said earlier, is the, is the, is the residual effect of what happens. So you do the deal, and then you have to support it, and you've been able to contain that and grow that space. So I applaud you uh, for, for having that vision to, to do that. But for, for you know, this, the philanthropic community, how, how are you measuring the success of the Strategic Neighborhood Fund? How, how do you know you're doing it right and, and you're getting out of it that, what you expected? Let me take that one. Yeah, I want you to take yeah, that one. Um, you know, so I might answer this differently than some of my colleagues. I mean, you know, for me, I want guys like Cliff and Madi and Peter and Dieter, you know, people who came in early, took real risk, put blood, sweat, and tears. I want them to make gobs of money doing this because that, that is the only way that this is sustainable, right? Like they're, yes. <laughs> I mean, we, people have to believe in this market. And so it is our job right now to put our capital at risk because it's highly risk tolerant capital, right? So we'll take that risk up front. But to me, success is when people look into a neighborhood and say, I'm gonna take my non-philanthropic capital and I'm gonna invest it in that place because I believe in the markets, right? It's beyond just, a, it's beyond a project finance, which sure. we can construct boxes all day to de-risk individual deals and you know, layer subsidy. But the market's only gonna thrive when people with real capital take real risk believing on a market, um, you know, in a neighborhood. And so that's how I'm going to measure a lot of it. The other measures we're going to have is really going to be around quality of life. It's not only about, who, you know, making gobs of money, but who's going who's to make that money, Who's right? going to make the money? Who's yeah. going to make that money? How widespread is the benefit? And is it reflective of neighborhood priorities? And so that's also our job is to ensure that the people who are resident in neighborhoods are resourced well so they can advocate for their position and for their neighborhoods. I, I do have a, a, another kind of follow-up question, and it has to do with the, the people that are, you know, uh, Detroiters um, who've come home. Um, it is, it is. Uh, do you feel like at this point for Detroit, and, and Gary, maybe you can answer this question, do you feel like the atmosphere for the type of new development, the new opportunities that we are kind of promoting um, over the last 30 minutes or so. You think the atmosphere for more outside capital to come into the market uh, exists? Uh, because in a perfect world, you have this kind of blended mix of, of private sector investment along with public sector support. Is the atmosphere even better now than it has been maybe a year ago even? So I can take you back 30 years. I've been down in Detroit for 30 years, and I have never seen a better opportunity, better atmosphere, better cooperation, better unity amongst uh, the philanthropic community, the corporate community, the business community, the small business person, the large company. Something is going on in Detroit today that is magical that we have not seen in many, many years in this town. It is an opportunity. We're looking for more and more people to come to the table. It's competitive, but it's not competition. There is so much to be done, and there is so much opportunity. There are so many ways to contribute. And what's happening in Detroit today, which I think is what motivated you to come to Detroit and so many others that are here, is the opportunity for Detroit to be the world-class city that we know it can be and is going to be, is right now, right here, and this is the opportunity. Can I throw in on that? Please do. I mean, I'm looking at Sue. I mean, Sue, how many, how many calls from New York private equity funds and family offices do you get, like, parading through with money, like, wanting to find deals? I mean, it is it is nonstop. Stop, yeah. Right? So, right, which is very, very different from where we were at the beginning of even the homecoming, right, where we were, like, begging people to come to town and take a look. It's a very different environment now. So we are welcoming those folks who want to come to town, do real work, 
bring capital with them, right, and want to like be invested for the long term. If what you're looking to do is come in and speculate and you know sit on capital, this is not an environment for you anymore. The market has changed. So we welcome people who want to do things. Right? And, and let me just say, I know we're out of time, but on the operational side, if you say, I want to place my capital there, but what does it look like on the other side? Not only did we open up 100% occupied and we have like 600 square feet of retail space that we're just holding out just for the right, um, the right tenant, um, but we have 120 people on our wait list. So there is a desire for people in the neighborhoods that if you have the right product, the right place at the right price, it is the right time. Right. And the people with the knowledge, right? Like invest in Cliff, right? He knows what he's doing, clearly. That's the kind of capital we need. So um, I hope you all are spirited and fired up about <laughs> bringing your money back home as I think you should be. Uh, but but uh, we have a, some Q&A. Uh, yeah. So, so um, uh, open for questions. How long we have? Thank you. Is that on? I was just curious how you all are thinking about in some of the neighborhoods that are not as close to the city center and the economic and employment rejuvenation, how does the school question fit into, I mean, your occupancy rates, are, I'm sure, would be different if you're in northwest Detroit or, you know, one of the west side neighborhoods. And I'm just wondering how you're... Could you could you repeat that? It was a uh, schools. How schools. do schools in some of the uh, neighborhoods that are in the lesser, not not close to the core of downtown and midtown? Like, how are you going to get these occupancy rates with families with little kids? Right. I mean, I'll, I'll take a stab. Um, so I'd ask you all to pay attention tomorrow. We're going to do an event tomorrow around education. Um, you know, everyone knows that that is the problem. Like that is the problem that we have not been able to crack. You know, I, I look to the leadership of the Skillman Foundation, what they have done in education as some very bright spots. I think our friends at Bedrock have also been extremely involved with trying to support the Detroit Public Schools. But, but to me, this is the thing that we all are going to end up needing to point to. And it feels a little bit like boiling the ocean, but if we continue to wait for a moment where the state's going to come to the rescue and, and improve per pupil funding, that the, you know, the, the school board is going to all align around a single priority. If we're going to wait for a perfect environment to focus attention on schools, we are going to wait forever. It's never going to happen. So, so we have to find multiple interventions and invest some capital and invest in some people to lead. And that, that is the answer for Detroit neighborhoods, right? Because families live in neighborhoods. Families live in single family homes. Families have kids and they want good schools. And that's what it comes down to. Um, this is for Gary. Gary, it's Randy over here, Randy Book. Good to see you. I got a question for you. What inning of the game are we in? If this was a baseball game, what inning are we in? Randy, how are you? Good. I think we're in the fourth inning. And uh, I say that. That's, this wasn't a, uh, a question that we planned, but I really believe we're in the fourth inning. I believe the opportunity, although it's different opportunity than it was two years ago or a year ago, Today, the opportunity is so broad. There is so much interest in Detroit. There are so many people that want to be here that we are just on the cusp of real growth and real opportunity. Kevin, I want to go work for you. <laughs> Howdy, everybody. Uh, this one's for Mr. Brown. Uh, uh, your product type, can you talk about that a little bit? It looked like it was three-story, stick-built, you know, I see those construction costs look a little spooky. You know, how did you guys navigate that? Was that mitigated through the type of product that you did? Anything like that? Product. So I'm going to try to repeat what you said. And you tell me if I missed something. Yes, sir. So I, the question was about product type as well as parking. Uh, no, I was saying uh, just in terms of the construction cost. Look, uh, on a previous slide, look, look pretty expensive. And so I'm just, uh, yeah. could you talk about yeah, the product so construction type? Cost. I'm so assuming we there at, was not a lot of steel involved in your project, things like that. So we were at about a buck ninety per square foot. Uh, the product is, is, it's one building, but it was constructed essentially to look as two buildings built over time. So there are eight townhomes along Coast Street. Those are each three story with a garage and a flex space on the first floor. The second level has uh, effectively a living area. And then the third level is uh, our um, bedrooms as well as bathrooms and a washer and dryer. 
Um, and those are, we call them two and a half bedrooms just because the flex space can be used as a bedroom or a home office. And then there are two bedrooms on, on the third floor. And then along Van Dyke, we have what we call the apartment building, which is four, uh, four flats above 1,200 square feet of, of retail. And in those four flats, we have uh, three of those are affordable. Um, and actually, I would argue that the, the floor plan and what we've done with the uh, flats is actually uh, even nicer than what we've done in the townhomes. And, and that was on purpose because we knew that the majority of affordable units were going to be there. And, and we didn't want to have affordable and market rate units. We just wanted to have different typologies. And so um, we have almost uh, nine or 10 foot ceilings in those Florida, uh, uh, Florida ceiling uh, windows as well as hardwood floors and backsplashes in the affordable units. And so they're really nice. And those are, they're three one bedrooms and one um, studio. Yeah, the question was around uh, female entrepreneurs and the struggle that you're facing in the in the local market, uh, and, and trying to find trying to find the contractors to 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 help you with your development pro pro exactly. projects. Is that correct? Yes. Um, Alicia Moss is a good person. We could we could put her in touch with. So uh, Alicia Moss, uh, yes, uh, actually, I was, you took the words out of my mouth. Alicia <laughs> Moss has been fantastic. And if you reach out to me, I can get you her contact information. Well, she can. She helps. She. 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 she for lack of a better word, she's a central to, uh, repository for services to help you find whatever level of service you need, whether it's contractors, electricians, da da da, uh, that kind of thing. And so she'd be able to. I'll be able to get, connect you with her. Any other questions? How are we doing? Sure. Ideally, uh, a city needs to have a mix of affordable and market rate spread throughout it. Uh, is there, I haven't been here in a long time, and I know there's a lot to be done, and I know there's uh, an objective to preserve affordability, but is there any oversight or master planning going on regarding where that mix comes from and how it gets integrated into otherwise neighborhoods that are now being redeveloped. The mix of affordable. The mix. mix of affordability. Is there any kind of oversight to ensure that there's affordability and there's a mix? So at a minimum, every project that is done that has any kind of funding, any kind of land purchase from the city has 80% uh, market rate and 20% affordable at a minimum. Um, and Arthur is, is a much better, and uh, Don Rencher is in here somewhere. They can speak uh, uh, much more eloquently than any of us regarding the plans for protection of uh, affordable, specifically naturally occurring affordable. But I know that they're working very hard and they're uh, uh, pitch for them. They're currently raising a fund to have dollars to put in to maintain um, the affordability for, for people who are naturally occurring affordable. This is Mike, could I speak up on this too? Uh, this billion dollar initiative is both a growth and inclusion initiative. So part of these dollars are specifically allocated so that as these neighborhoods start to recover, this recovery is for all Detroiters, including those who have already been there. So every project will be a minimum of 20% of the units at 80% AMI, and any project that uh, touches the affordable housing leverage fund will be at least 60% AMI. So Cliff's project has 25% of the units affordable. The larger project up the street has 50% of those units affordable, 20% of which, this is a lot of numbers, at 50% AMI or lower. A lot of Detroit, you really don't start touching until you get to that 50% AMI level or lower. The median income in Detroit is $25,000. So there's a lot of thought to putting these affordable tools up front. Um, Kevin comes from Atlanta. They're in the rearview mirror trying to fix some of their displacement and affordability problems. If you don't take care of this on the front end, like we're trying to do now, uh, San Francisco has one example, two and a half times the cost for every affordable unit than what we're raising right now to spend. So that's all the time that we have for questions. But again, 
breakfast tomorrow, and there, you'll be able to meet a lot of the speakers. I want to thank this panel and uh, its wonderful moderator, Kevin, for being here today. And I want to highlight two things for those of you who are attending more of the homecoming. One is that Friday morning, we're focused on education. Nikolai Viti, who is the, uh, he came last year, he had been on the job like a month and a half. So now he's had one year in, he's going to be talking about his vision for the Detroit Public Community School District. Um, and, uh, and I think that'll be a very interesting conversation. Um, you know, when I moved to Detroit, there were 200,000 kids in the Detroit public schools. Now there's about 50,000. And that's part of that is charter schools, but part of it is that parents have elected to take their kids to schools outside the city of Detroit. So the partnership between Nikolai Vitti uh, the, uh, an assortment of charter schools and Mayor Duggan in creating after school opportunities and more amenities that parents will choose Detroit schools is a big push this fall. And it's a new program that just launched in Northwest Detroit and we'll be talking about that on Friday. For someone who wanted to uh, know more about women contractors, Adrienne Bennett, who's going to be on the panel tomorrow morning, is um, she's in the back of the room, and I bet you she has a Rolodex that would help you out because she is a uh, the first female master plumber, I believe, in the United States of America. And she has her own contracting company and is very well networked and would probably know a long list of women contractors in this market. So you want to make sure that you connect with Adrian. Thank you. All right, next up. Thank you, guys.